I'm going to add my voice to those who've uh, thanked the conference organizers for inviting us and having this very interesting set of conversations. Um, my paper, which is done with uh, Karel Kolev, who's an assistant professor at Hendrick College. I'm at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Um, the, I think there are two things that, two objectives we had in this paper. One was to look at a core feature of electoral systems that is formula. A lot has been written about this and the impact of formula. And generally speaking, the, the distinction between using PR multi-member system versus a first-past-the-post one or two district system. And we know from work in political economy that this has an effect on consumer prices. This has an effect on how, we get, how, we get, how egalitarian public policies are. We know, of course, it has an effect on the number of parties. And we decided to look at what effect formula has, electoral formula has, on the quality of an election and the denunciation of fraud. And we use a two-pronged research strategy. We embed a subnational research design within a cross-national framework. The subnational research design draws upon work that I've done before, looking at the denunciation of fraud in Costa Rica over a 50-year period, at the beginning of the 20th century till about 1949. The, the other part of the project, and I'll put up the a graph, uses the quality of the elections data set. This is a data set developed by Judith Kelly. Carell was actually the research assistant on that project. Um, and now we're collaborating on a paper. And they, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, project, this codes annual US State Department reports on human rights and related things. And for this number of elections between 1975 and 2005, we see, approximately speaking, 25% of the election, columns four and five, have rather serious problems. And we decided to try to, in good scientific fashion, destroy our hypothesis and try to see whether formula has any independent effect. I'm not going to go through all the, all the details of our models. This gives you a sense of some of the things that we've done. And the results are these, which is probably what you want to see at almost 5 o'clock uh, at the end of the first day of the conference. <laughs> but for those of you, and I can notice a few of you, you didn't drop your eyebrows, but I do notice you look someplace else, some interpretation. And if you look at the top row, what we see is the probability of having a free and fair election is always higher using PR than using um, plurality. And the reason why we have six models is it's hard to come up with measures of social structural diversity, ethnic diversity, so we use a number of different data sets. It's all in the paper. Uh, well. We try to destroy uh, the hypothesis. It survived this part of the test. Um, the next thing that we did was we relied upon this work that I've done earlier, um, mentioned earlier from about 1901 to 1948. And there were, just to update you this, um, there were presidential elections every four years, legislative elections every two years, and there were seven electoral districts. And interestingly enough, um, if the election involved more than three deputies, that is three deputies were being elected, then a version of PR was used. If an election involved the return of one or two deputies representing that district province, there are seven provinces, seven electoral districts, then plurality was used. Um, and what we've done here is coded by the core and periphery, uh, the, the core provinces are where approximately 80% of the electorate is residing. The other ones, roughly speaking, where 20% of the uh, electorate is residing. There, are, there is an N of 175 district elections, if you will. 34% of them, slightly more than a third, are using first past the post. For those of you who didn't have 
enough uh, electoral uh, regression coefficients. I'll show you a few more in a minute. We had a hard time coming up with measures of social structure. The story is that the social structure of the, I'll go back here for a second, of the peripheral provinces, this is where United Fruit operated, this is where large cattle growing operations. So these, this was a social environment where you saw a great deal of social and economic inequality. You saw much less of that in the core provinces. Um, and what we gravitated toward was using two measures, proxy measures of social structure given, constrained by the data as we are, literacy rates which tended to be lower in the periphery and population density rates. Hence this point I mentioned earlier that one out of five voters on average lived in the periphery during this period and more regression coefficients. Still not so much fun to read so I'll do the interpretation and um, a point to interpreting this, the higher the eligible voters per accusation or actual voters per accusation are, that means f less denunciation of fraud. So the way the dependent variable that we came up with is we have information about the denunciation of fraud. These are partisan collections of data. So after an election was held, those who felt they were victims of administrative irregularities, fraud, could then denounce their opponents and send these petitions to the Congress. At this point, at the beginning of the 20th century, like most constitutions of the world, the, the executive organized elections and the legislature certified them, something that I've called in other work the classical theory of electoral governance. Um, we're drawing the close to 1,300 accusations of fraud from the approximately 123 petitions sent to the National Congress during this period of time. So the higher the number, that means the more voters per accusation. That's our reasoning there. And again, what we see, it's very hard, as in the earlier cross-national work as well as this one, it's very hard to say whether the formula has more of an impact than the social structure measures. And I, I think that's in one sense beside the point. The point here is independently of social characteristics and those are proxies for the way power gets exercised in society, pre-politics you might say, formula, something very simple of converting votes into seats has an impact. And this is what, this is what we find. A couple just conclusions. Um, how much time do I have left? I have five minutes left, so I could, I could talk to you what, well, I'll just make a couple of conclusions, I'll sit down. Um, one conclusion, obviously, is broad characteristics of electoral systems seem to have very discernible effects. Nothing new here. It's nice to get evidence, especially about a property, a characteristic of electoral systems about which much has been written, not so much in the area of the denunciation of fraud. There are a couple of papers here. Sarah Birch has written a very nice one on Eastern Europe, um, but there's not a lot of efforts to really get at this. What's our reasoning here? Why do we think uh, that formula would have an impact. Well, one of the things you notice is if an election is run through plurality, it can be won or lost by little as one vote, which creates a very powerful incentive for losers to denounce the results, either to, to commit fraud or to denounce it. Uh, as Pippa mentioned this morning, I'm very careful about not actually speaking about fraud, but actually speaking about the denunciation of irregularities and fraud. That's kind of our mechanism here. And I would say then that when we go about designing an electoral system, that lots of these things could have long-term and short-term impacts. And I think I'll leave my remarks like that. <laughs>